all of the religions are the same. For example, if you uh, look at uh, the Viracochas, for example, of South America, Peru, Viracocha from the Quechua language means foam of the sea. And it seems to me that the reason they call these characters foam of the sea is because they were perfect. And we're only perfect when we're in the foam of the sea. Because at that time we're in contact with the earth, the fire, the air and the water. If we were to move, for example, away from the water onto the land, we would no longer be in, in contact with all four. And if we were to move into the water, we'd lose contact with the sea. So that's why they call these spiritual teachers viracochas, because they lived in the foam of the sea, the milky ocean. And this is why the Hindu in India worship the cow, because the cow gives milk, and they believe that heaven to be a milky ocean. So it's the same beliefs globally, not just about the foam of the sea, but about all aspects of spirituality and religion. Uh, they all go into sun worship. They all go into meditation. They all explain how to increase the energy in the bod body through meditation. Uh, you're describing one way of tapping into the sun at various times of the day or seasons, etc. They also have done experiments on planting crops by moonlight. And uh, the Bhagavad Gita explains... The, the best time for the soul to leave the body, depending on the phase of the moon or the phase of the sun and so on. So uh, I'm not specifically uh, familiar with the practices that you've mentioned about the Indian uh, uh, meditation practices, but, but it, it, take it for granted that all the religions are the same. They're just different leaders who brought the same information to earth at different moments throughout human history. Thanks for the call, James. What's your take on astral projection, Maurice? Uh, I think, yes, definitely. I think uh, I've, I've witnessed it myself. I've, I've been with clairvoyance. I've witnessed phenomena which is very difficult to describe, not altogether impossible to describe. Uh, it means that we fully, we don't understand ourselves and we don't understand the energy dimensions around us. Some people are sensitive. They can tap into these uh, energy sources and by tapping into them they can provide us with information uh, I've been to clairvoyants who've told me that I was going to write so many books what the books would be on uh, they've discussed the contents of the books with me and I'm going back 20 years now these are people I've never met so they, they, these are not ambiguous readings or ramblings of somebody who's incoherent these are specific, unchallengeable aspects of what actually happened in the years that followed. So I absolutely do believe in it, yes. Viewing? Remote viewing, exactly, yes. I mean, if, uh, if somebody says, says that uh, I can see something in uh, another side of the planet, I see no reason why that shouldn't be the case, because... If you think of telepathy, for example, once we understand how gravity works, we have gravity waves traveling from, if we're in the same room, then I have a gravity wave from my body to your body. You have a gravity wave from your body to my body. Now, if my brain waves modulate the gravity wave, then my thoughts can be read by you and your thoughts can be read by me. And in the same way, if I'm sitting in a room as I am now, uh, several thousand miles away, then my gravity waves are traveling down this phone line connection to you. Your gravity waves are traveling down the phone line connection to me. There's no reason why I can't remotely tap into your brain waves because we have a, a radio frequency carrier that we can modulate our brainwave activity upon. So it's, it's, it's quite straightforward. It's not magic. There's nothing difficult about it. And as, as I say, remote viewing, there's no reason. You know, we're all connected. Every atom is connected to every other atom. So there's no reason if we're sensitive enough and tuned into the right frequency, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to measure things on different sides of our planet or other planets. At all, it's very simple, very straightforward. In order for gravity work to work, the electron must be changed into a coil, a coil shape, because that way, as it orbits the proton in the middle, it cuts through the electric field between the proton and the electron, and magnetism is induced into the electron, which causes the electron to spin. So, by making the electron coil-shaped, we 
we, we, the atom comes to life. It starts to radiate energy. The second change I had to make to make gravity work was to change the neutron in larger atoms from being a, a spherical shape, a billiard ball type particle, into a spike shape. Now this is, again has been proven. The Hahn Meitner Institute in Germany in 2009 said that uh, neutrons align themselves with magnetic fields, a major scientific discovery. If they align themselves, they can't be spherical, they must be spike-shaped. They call them needles. Neutrons must be needle-shaped, they say. That's exactly what I've been proposing since 2007, when I came out with a basic model. So my neutron, it consists of three particles, just like the conventional one, but the conventional one complicates everything. The conventional one shows the neutron comprising of a small negative particle, a small positive particle, and a small neutral particle. But nobody explains, if this is true, why the, elect the electrical positive doesn't get shorted out with the electrical negative. Now what I've done is I've separated those two by the neutral particle to stop them short-circuiting. And that makes the three balls line up, if you like, in a line. And instead of showing them as three balls, I've shown them as two batteries connected together with a zone in the middle. And the zone refers to what physicists call the antineutrino, which doesn't actually exist. It's simply a corridor of charge, which is neither negative nor positive, because the two come together and then neutralize. So once we get the neutron, take the neutron away from being a ball, and make it a spike shape, stick it back into the atom, then we can understand why the electrons can't get to the middle and why the middle can't spring apart, because the spiked neutrons behave like springs. They force the electrons out and they force the protons in, and it's as simple as that. Time, and we have to be mindful that there is no such thing as time in the spirit world, in the world of energy. Time began when the universe began and matter appeared. Before that, there was only light and God. And uh, this is why the soul inside feels the same at the age of eight as it does at 28 and 58 and 78, because there are no such thing as time for the soul. It's only the body that falls to pieces in front of the mirror. It's only the body, which is matter, which is affected by time, and that's an important consideration. Well, that would explain quite a bit, Maurice, because I still feel like I'm 18, but it, it certainly doesn't feel like my foot feels like it's 18 anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Thanks for the call, Randy. Uh, so what's next for you? What else do you work on, Maurice? Well, I've done what I came to do, I think, George. So I'm, I'm trying to have a rest and trying to purify the spirit inside. Uh, I'm unfortunate in, in, in uh, having or knowing the people I've known have all died at the age of 60. So I've reached the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that men die at 60 and women die at 80. Now, I'm 59, so I'm beginning to start taking things easier. Well, and, well tell uh, me this. You, you had said earlier that some psychics or some sensitives had told you how many books you would write. Is this how many? I've written them, yes. This is how many. Ooh, that's, that's kind of spooky. Not really, because the time comes, we have to move on. But... Uh, uh, you know, it's just another journey. The soul is imperishable, it's indestructible, and it's eternal. So, you know, if anybody offered, the way I look at it is this, if somebody offered you a new car for your old one, would you take it? The answer Absolutely. Is yes. If they offered you a new suit for your old suit, would you take it? Absolutely. Would you uh, accept a new body for your old one? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I think well, I needed one. <laughs> Only if you think about it, though, because the old one's all gray and bald and sick and fat and flabby or whatever. Well, it's not that bad. Come on. <laughs> uh, uh, Maurice Cotterell, thanks very much. The author of Future Science, who enjoyed it very much. Uh, George Norrie's back tomorrow night. I'll see you next month, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.